our dogs are closer to the ground, right? So they're getting a higher concentration of those types of chemicals. And, you know, as, as canine cancer increases, I think Dr. Kendra Pope said that for every human that's diagnosed with cancer, five dogs are diagnosed with cancer. Welcome to the Pet Care Report podcast by Pet Summits. Here's your natural dog health care host, Alora McKinley. Well, g'day, guys. Welcome back to another episode of the Pet Care Report. Now, did you know that the skin is the largest organ of our bodies? And the same applies to our dogs. And so it makes sense to think that what we put on our dog's coat and skin does affect it and get absorbed to some extent. What you probably didn't realize is that your grooming products may contain harsh chemicals that can negatively impact your dog's health. Now, on that note, I'm joined by Belissa Bolland and Angela Koppel, and they are the founders of Four Legger. Now, Four Legger is a mission-based business created to develop dog shampoo and grooming products that meet the strict standard for organic certification, as required by the USDA National Organic Program for Pets. Now, Melissa and Angela are passionate about educating and empowering pet parents about ingredients used in grooming products and why they matter. And that's why four legger products have been carefully and lovingly created. Thank you so much for joining me today, guys. Thank you for having us. Hello. Good morning. Hello. Now, can you tell us a little bit about dog shampoos? Because I hear they contribute to skin allergies. They do. Um, and actually, just because of the way you worded that, I would I would be quick to say that allergies has kind of become the catch-all for everything that makes a dog itch. <laughs> And that's not really true. I mean, it's not normal for a dog to be itchy any more than it's normal for us humans to walk around scratching all the time. So it is always whenever you see something that or see your dog that's just incessantly itching or scratching, you know right away something is wrong. It's probably wrong with the immune system. It could be wrong just at the coat level, but generally those things come from more of an internal source and manifest themselves on the coat. So um, it's always, you know, um, a definite trigger or not, not trigger, but a definite clue that something is wrong. Either the diet's wrong or medicines are wrong or vaccinations are wrong um, that is contributing to that. And the way that shampoos further contribute to that is many of them have ingredients that actually cause those things, <laughs> which, you know, sounds kind of ridiculous. Why would you use an ingredient that is associated with itching? Um, but it's m way more common than people think. And so it's important to know what's in the product that you're using Um even if you're doing everything that you can to kind of clean up a gut issue or, you know, some other issue, immune issue that's causing the problem in the first place, if you don't follow that up with a good, non-toxic, safe, healthy product that doesn't have any ingredients that are going to exacerbate that, um, then you're, you're kind of just keeping yourself in square one all the time and you're not going to make any progress because as fast as you clean up one thing, you're just dumping something back on them that's stirring it all up again. Yeah, and I'll add to that. I mean, the 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 Morris Animal Foundation did a study that looked over at 3,000 golden retrievers. And the first, they were actually looking for the cause of the rise in cancer for the golden retriever population. And one of the first things that they found as an early warning indication of a problem was all of the dogs in the study started having skin issues. And that was really an early indication of greater disease in that population of animals. And, you know, it's no surprise that Dr. Kendra Pope, a board certified canine oncologist, said that the number one reason for the increase in canine cancer is environmental toxins. I mean, no question about it. It's environmental toxins. So it's what we're putting on them. Um, it's what we're putting you know, in their environment. <laughs> and, you know, I think the crazy statistic is that, you know, over 50% of dogs um, over the age of two will be diagnosed with cancer. And 95% of those cancers are from environmental toxins. Only 5% are actually genetic. So, you know, we have, I think, an incredible opportunity right now um, as dog 
and you know pet parents because we can prevent some of these cancers from ever happening right cancers are mutations cancers are caused from you know repeated assaults in the body and a change in a genetic mutation so if we can stop that or prevent that from happening then every pet parent should say sign me up how do i do this you know how do i stop cancer from getting in my dog and how do I prevent this from happening? Yep. So are there particular chemicals then that are in shampoos and conditioners that pet parents should be aware of? Yes, almost all <laughs> of them. <laughs> yeah. I mean, literally, if it's if it's a very chemical sounding name that you can't pronounce, you probably don't want it on your dog. If you can determine from the ingredient label that it's a detergent, which, you know, just just to clarify, with regard to cleansing agents for shampoos and soaps and uh, any kind of cleansing agent. There's only two kinds. There's soap, which is 100% natural, and there is synthetic-based detergents, which, you know, is kind of a no-brainer. And unfortunately, probably more than 95% of the shampoos that are in the commercial marketplace right now are detergents. And they're full of synthetics, and they're full of all kinds of ingredients that Either there's not enough research about or there's not ever been any research done with regard to dogs. There's a lot um, of research relating health conditions and itching and those kinds of things to humans. And we extrapolate that to dogs because we don't test on dogs, <laughs> uh, which would you know totally be in violation of any of, any of our mission um, foundations. And so, it, yeah, it's it's really sad that there's just more ingredients in a bottle of dog shampoo that you don't want on your dog than are ingredients that you wouldn't mind having on your dog. Mm. And you have to remember, too, they're not just getting on your dog, they're getting on you. You know, they, dogs don't weigh themselves. So, you know, anytime you're dipping your hands into it and scrubbing them up and rinsing them off, you're getting just as much exposure to those kinds of dangerous ingredients as your dog is yeah and are there any regulations on dog shampoos or can anybody just put whatever they want yes there are in the united states there are no regulations there is no um, agency governmental or otherwise that has any regulatory control over what most dog manufacturers will put in a bottle of shampoo and sell it for shampoo now, the one exception to that is where four-legger comes in because all of our products are regulated and certified through the USDA National Organic Program. We have to prove, you know, what is in the bottle. We can't just say the ingredients that sound nice or, you know, aren't objective to anyone. We, ha we literally are required to list every single ingredient there is a paper chain from, for every single ingredient from the time that it's a seed in the ground until it's in the bottle on the shelf. Wow. And so, yeah. And including how the soil is taken care of. Yeah. I mean, you can't treat the soil with, with anything, right? Yeah. Pesticides, herbicides. Yeah. You're just, you're just, you know, putting blind faith in the hands of manufacturers that are making a product strictly for profit. They don't really care about your dog. And they just know that everybody does care. Everybody else cares about their dogs and wants the best thing. So they're going to do whatever they can to market it in a way that sounds natural, that sounds organic, and that will make somebody buy something that if they really knew what they were buying, they would never even pick it up. It just makes it so tricky then for pet parents. You know, if you're buying a product that says it's natural and organic and then you turn around and check the ingredients list, you know, that, that's really tricky. My parents really have to be careful. You know, and that's what happened to us. I mean, that's why we really got on our mission was because we, as we say, we got duped, right? <laughs> and we realized after a while that, you know, the ingredients on the back of the bottle were greenwashed. I mean, it said all natural dog cleansing agent or something, you know, it was so generalized. And I was like, well, what does that even mean? What, you know, what, what is that ingredient? That's not an ingredient. That's, you know, a generalization of an ingredient. That's not an actual ingredient. And, you know, Melissa can tell our, our story of how we got started in the, 
in the dog grooming industry, but you know, we basically just got, hey, we can change this industry. We can make it more transparent. We can make it more honest. And, you know, we can be the voice for pet parents when it comes to the grooming industry by educating them about ingredients. Mm. And going back to, you mentioned environmental toxins. So what kind of effects do they have on our dogs and on us? A big talker about environmental toxins. I mean, it's, you know, it's everything from the, the yard treatments, mosquito treatments. I mean, our dogs are closer to the ground, right? So they're getting a higher concentration of those types of chemicals. And, you know, as, as canine cancer increases, I think Dr. Kendra Pope said that for every human that's diagnosed with cancer, five dogs are diagnosed with cancer. I mean, and the amount of cancer in the canine population is just continuing to increase. And, you know, you didn't see this years ago in the 1970s, you really didn't see the prevalence of canine cancer. And it was when, you know, and I remember we had a dog that was a mostly outdoors dog. And when we brought that dog in the house and our kind of lives changed and then we became more focused on the dog and he, you know, she became more of a family member to us. We started bathing her more frequently. And you know, I think that that has really changed from the 1970s to today. Our dog is a member of the family. And as our members of the family became family, we really changed how, you know, we started treating them with flea and tick medicine and, you know, <laughs> all of this stuff that we have introduced into their lives that weren't natural and weren't normal for their population. And, Now we see the steady increase in canine cancer. We see an increase in itchy skin, hormone disruption, organ system toxicity, developmental toxicity, cancer. I mean, all of these problems that we're seeing in this, you know, in the canine community are because we humans have introduced something foreign into their world. And, you know, we have a, again, we have this great opportunity because we control that. You know, I mean, I can't control what my neighbors are putting on their yard, but I can control that I can bring my dog home and I can rinse her off and I can bathe her more frequently when she goes on walks through people's yards to make sure that her exposure to those things are lower. You know, it was interesting. I was reading something on Facebook the other day where someone asked, how frequently do you wash your dog? And somebody said, oh, I wash my dog like a couple times a year. And I'm like, well, you know, I guess that would depend on where you live, what's your exposure. But we live in an urban area. We have neighbors who do treat their yards with, you know, yard treatments, flea and tick stuff. I mean, mosquitoes. There's all sorts of things that people are treating their yards with. So I bathe our dogs a lot more frequently because of their high exposure to these environmental toxins. I mean, in the summer, we, we do bathe a lot more frequently, like every couple of weeks, because we just want to get the environmental toxins off their bodies. And I think that that's incredibly important for people to understand. You know, your dog, depending on its exposure, might need to be bathed more frequently just to keep it safer. Yeah, just to add to that um, a little bit, it, it shouldn't necessarily be how often should you bathe your dog. You, because as Angela rightly says, that depends. I mean, if you live on 50 acres and, you know, aren't surrounded by anything except nature and wildlife, then yeah, your dog may not need more frequent bathing. But a better guideline than just saying you should bathe your dog twice a month is let your dog tell you when they need a bath. If they start scratching more, they're uncomfortable and they've got something on their skin that needs to be washed off. And if it, 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 the same as you and I, I mean, if we go outside, I, personally, I'm a mosquito magnet. If I, if I go outside, it looks like I've got a big buffet sign across my forehead and all the mosquitoes come running. So if I, you know, if I'm out, probably part of that psychological, I just start scratching. <laughs> and so, you know, the first thing I do is come in and take a shower. But, you know, dogs don't have that that capacity. I mean, they're depending on someone else to give them a bath. And if you notice your dog, you know, 
three or four days or a week after you've given them bath, their itchiness and level of scratching has increased. They're telling you something. And that's a better rule to follow than just, oh, well, you know, it's still a week before he's supposed to get another bath. So we're just going to let him be miserable for a week. (laughs) Yeah, that's interesting that you wash your dog so frequently. Do you find that their skin dries out, Angela? Not, Not when you use a natural shampoo like ours. If you use one that is 100% detergent based, full of synthetics, many of them petrol related, um, and then not even knowing what all the possible contaminants are that have followed that chemical along into the shampoo as a result of manufacturing processes. Um, yeah, I mean, absolutely. You, 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 You can bathe your dog as frequently as you need to if you're using a proper shampoo for that that is natural to their skin. It's natural to their coat. It matches, you know, our our products are more alkaline than human products are. And that's because canine skin is more alkaline. And so we're, we're matching what is more healthy for the dog. And so as long as you have all of that, those considerations accounted for with the type of product that you're going to use to bathe your dog, then, I mean, we've got some dogs in our pack that um, have issues with incontinence. And so they're having to have at least a hiney wash, you know, multiple times a day. And when they use our product, it's not a problem because it's not harsh. It's not going to strip the skin oils. It's not going to disrupt the sebum balance on the skin in any way and it's just going to help to wash off what needs to be washed off and and give them some comfort Hmm. can you tell us a bit more about the ingredients then you use in four leggers yeah we're um we are a soap based product and so we use um organic vegetable oils and run them through a process called saponification which basically involves throwing them in a big pot and cooking them <laughs> with um, a lye, uh, an, a, a reactive agent that is natural, it's potassium hydroxide. And um, that is what converts the oils into soap. And we continue the process until w- we test it as we go. And so once the all of the alkali that has been added to to Um, create that conversion process is gone, it's done so that nothing is left except the natural ingredient. And then depending on the formulation, we add in um, different essential oils that are chosen to address certain types of skin and coat issues. And they're all pest deterrents. So, you know, because we know pests are, you know, big for dogs and, um, You know, so we choose essential oils very carefully so that it's not just a good scent. It actually has a purpose. Yeah. And I noticed, too, that you guys also have a hypoallergenic one, which has no essential oils. Right. And I mean, truthfully, they're all hypoallergenic because really hypoallergenic means there's not any ingredient in this that is particularly associated with with triggering an allergic response. So then I noticed too on your website, you had a link to something called the Pet Shampoo Ingredient Database. Can you tell us a bit about why you started that? We did. um, When when we first started Four Legger, um, we just have begun our ninth year. And so in 2015, when we were, when we launched the 21 or two months leading up to that, we had just been... um, researching ingredients. We knew we knew what was out there. We knew what we didn't want and we couldn't find what we did want. So we thought, okay, we're just going to have to do this ourselves. And the only way to gain any distinction between us and everybody else that's out there is to go through the National Organic Program, which is what we did. So then in 2020, so we had done like literally 17 months worth of research on ingredients. A, an enormous amount of research on ingredients that other companies were using in their products. And so during COVID, when nobody was moving, nobody was doing anything, um, we were cleaning the house and cleaning computers and everything and ran across all of this research and just thought, you know, 
this is a shame that we've got all this information, all this data here, and it's not doing anybody any good at all. And so Angela is the one who kind of took that project by the by the bullhorn and created the database that breaks it down because part of the problem that we had when we were researching, it's very difficult to find accurate information on the internet anymore. I mean, it's just a, a bunch of stuff. You have to spend as much time wading through what's good information and what's bad information. And then you have to start wading through the good information to get, get wh- where you're headed. And so um, we wanted it to be in a very presentable format so that when somebody wanted to, to research an ingredient, they could go to our, go to the database and put in the ingredient and it, we use a drop down menu for that. And you're going to get back three criteria. The first criteria is that ingredient, a synthetic ingredient, or is it a natural ingredient? The second criteria is how safe is it? And we use little smiley faces and, you know, very angry faces to, <laughs> to help highlight that. And then the third criteria is could this ingredient even be certified organic? Because, you know, everybody says their stuff's organic. And so we're going to take it then another step. And in the that second criteria, if it comes back as not safe in any way at all, we're going to list from the research, from the literature, all of the health conditions that have ever been associated with that particular ingredient for both humans and dogs. So, I mean, you can literally sit down, line your bottles up in front of you and just start going through ingredients and you can you can do your own research very quickly, very efficiently, and decide for yourself if you think that okay, well, maybe this isn't the product that I want to be using on my dog. <laughs> well done, Angela. That would have been a huge a huge task, and that's actually what I did yesterday. I got my shampoos and I I looked them up, and all the ingredients were there, and it was so simple um, to use. Well, fantastic. That's great to hear. <laughs> it is a great tool. We go to a lot of um, holistic events and um you know where there are holistic veterinarians and practitioners of all kind and they all are just crazy over it because it helps them save so much time with um with their clients coming to them and asking for recommendations for stuff if they have that resource readily available to them then that cuts through a lot of the work that they have to go through and they can send somebody away with good information instead of just kind of going by what they've always recommended before and not really knowing or what's you know, just kind of, best. right what's marketed best exactly i'm sure you've had heaps of feedback then on four leggers being such a unique uh, product to the grooming industry are there any specific changes that pet parents have reported in their dogs oh gosh yes we get we get those those are my favorite emails to get you know <laughs> It, you know, it's interesting when when we first started, you know, the questions were kind of general, you know, which, which, should I get lavender or should I get lemongrass? I was like, well, you know, <laughs> there might be a little more to it than that. But, <laughs> but, you know, over the years, those the questions that we get now because of our reputation in the industry, they're very complex questions, you know, and dogs that have had chronic issues for years and you know they're coming back and saying after they've they've had some experience with four-legger and dealing with some of those things like fungal infections and bacterial infections yeast is part of the fungal family um, which is so common and they're just amazed that in a short while their their dog or their pet is so much better than they ever have been And it only gets better, you know, from there. It's these kinds of things build on each other. So the longer you use a product that's actually healthy for you, the more the benefits are going to be over time. And so that's why you don't want to, I think one of the problems in, in the United States anyway, especially is people just kind of want a silver bullet, right? They want something that's going to fix everything and it, it doesn't exist. And so people need to 
kind of avoid the knee jerk reaction of just jumping from one product to another, to another, to another, and not give any, anything a chance to work. I mean, let's face it. If you spent eight years bathing your dog in something that is nothing more than a bottle of toxic goo, it's not reasonable to expect that after one bath, our product is going to heal them. <laughs> you need to give it the same amount of time, <laughs> but it won't take that. <laughs> but I will say it's interesting that, I mean, a lot of the customers that we get, they say they noticed a difference after the first bath. You know, there's less itching, there's less scratching after that first bath. And I also think it's really important for people to understand that ingredients are cumulative in the body. So when you wash your dog, you use warm water and the warm water opens their pores and the ingredients can get in through the skin barrier and into their body. And that's how kind of the organ system toxicity and cancer and all that stuff comes about from ingredients. And they're not just one and done, right? You don't just wash your dog, you rinse it off and they're, you know, it's gone, it's done. Ingredients are cumulative in the body. So they build up and build up and build up over time until a point where you have a, an issue with toxicity. And, you know, that's when you have, you know, you start to see troubles with the liver or, you know, all sorts of these health issues, the itchy skin, all of that. And I think another really important thing for people to understand is when their dog is battling yeast and they're using like a medicated dog shampoo, there's a lot of toxicity in dog in medicated dog shampoo too, particularly. And it was one of the reasons why we developed our tea tree and peppermint shampoo, which is all natural and kind of, you know, by used by holistic vets as a replacement for medicated dog shampoo, because it's a lot safer to use. And, you know, you're not going to have the issue with accumulation in the body of toxic ingredients with our shampoos. Um, they're very safe. They're very gentle. They're very mild. I think that's a great point. You mentioned that not only are you going to see some short-term effects, but it's also long-term what the product's going to do for your dog. Yeah, the long-term you can see, right? <laughs> yeah. yeah, it's interesting. You know, people that have had, you know, a dog or have, you know, had dogs their whole life, it's it's really striking how often we hear something like, well, you know, I've had this, my dog's eight years old and they've always been healthy. They've never had any problems. And all of a sudden they're sick or they're scratching. It's, and it's not all of a sudden. These things matter from the, the time they are born all the way through the rest of their life. It, that you, you're, you, you can't just play Russian roulette and think, you know, okay, well, my dog, I'm going to keep doing this because I like the way this shampoo smells. Or like, you know, this aspect or that aspect of it. And then be surprised when your dog turns up sick. Because, you know, it's probably not just the shampoo. It could, you know, it can be a accumulation also of, of over medication, over vaccination, a poor diet. And all of that stuff accumulates in the body as well. And there, there's a trigger that happens with every animal human or dog that is ever diagnosed with cancer, there is a trigger that happens. And so everything that you can do to avoid getting to that point is what we need to be doing as responsible pet owners to help never have to hear in the vet office, your dog has cancer because you know, that, that is the worst news that you can get if you're a pet owner is your dog has cancer and you know, with the statistics the way that they are now, which Angel has already mentioned, um, you know, 50% of all dogs over two are going to get that diagnosis. And it's just, it's unacceptable when it is so unavoidable with just making better choices in all aspects of a dog's life, but also with shampoo and grooming products. You can't ignore that as well. And, um, you know, we just... We can't stress that enough that it, it all matters and everything builds on everything else so that if you want to give your dog the best chance to not get that diagnosis, then you need to do everything that you can because one thing is true. You're either going to pay for quality products or you're going to pay for treatment. And treatment is always going to be much more expensive than just buying good quality products in the first place. 
good points. Now, if pet parents were going to take away one thing from this episode, what do you think that that point should be? Database. (laughs) Don't buy anything for your dog without looking it up in that database. And we have even an option on the page that if there's an ingredient in there that we've missed, you can submit that ingredient and we'll scientifically review it and analyze it and add it to the database so that it's there for the next person that's looking for that ingredient. But you just, you you have to get past the, oh, the convenience of just reading the label and seeing all the right words, you know, and, and assuming that that is the truth because it's just not. Yeah, that's really interesting. And I would encourage people to sign up for our blog on our website. I mean, we do a lot of articles about pet shampoo, um, about, you know, what does natural shampoo mean? I mean, we have a lot of, a lot of insights into what parents, pet parents should be looking for. So feel free to come to our website, sign up for the blog, go to the pet shampoo ingredient database and look up ingredients there as well. Yep. And just for our people listening, what is the Four Legs website? It's www the number four dash legger.com. Beautiful. That's great. And they can access the database from there. I think you can just Google it as well. I think it comes up. Yeah. If, if you go to the four legger website um, at the very top left, there's a link to the pet shampoo ingredient database, or you can put pet shampoo ingredient database.com. Yeah, that's great. And you guys have a huge range of shampoo and conditioners with minimal ingredients and Lots of essential oils. I really liked that. Well done. Actually, the, you know, kind of the full full grooming line. I mean, yes, we have the shampoos, we have a conditioner, but we also have a skin balm. We have a, a dental powder product that's for oral hygiene. And then we have a deodorizing spray line that is also a great way because nobody's going to bathe their dog every day, right? <laughs> um, but they need that essential oil support on their skin every day. And so we use the same kinds of ingredients in, in our spray product that you can just spritz right on your dog every single day and keep them surrounded by the benefits of those essential oils to help keep their skin and coat healthy in between baths. There you go. It's got almost everything then for pet parents that they may need for their, their pets. Well, thank you, Angela and Melissa, for joining me today. And if you're listening, you can follow, subscribe, and leave a review if you found something in this Uh, interview interesting we'll put some links to the girls website in our show notes and if you have any questions for us just leave them in the box below thanks so much for joining us and i'll see you next time right thank you thank you